I have the privilege of ending our, our lectures. And really, this, this topic, we, we at the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center wanted to take this opportunity to talk with you about this evolving definition of Alzheimer's disease, which I imagine many of you have heard about or read about in the news. Now, Alzheimer's disease is a complex disease, and so it's not surprising that how we define it is complicated. Important changes in how we view Alzheimer's disease were made in early 2018 that we think are gonna have a major impact in how we conduct research and how we are conducting research. So for the next few minutes, I hope to shed light on this new definition and what it means to us. Now forgive me, I'm gonna to have to do a couple of, of changes here at the same time. Okay. All right. So when trying to, to define Alzheimer's disease, I think about it from two perspectives. Now for me, this is Alzheimer's disease. It is my father, it's the person. But of course, Alzheimer's disease isn't a person, though I believe those of us in the room that have a loved one affected would, would say that it feels that way. But another way of saying this is that we can view Alzheimer's disease for what it is on the outside. You can see the personality changes, the physical changes that people undergo, along with recognizing the changes in the memory and the thinking skills. Now, the second perspective of Alzheimer's disease is what it is on the inside, what we can't see in a living person, and that's the changes that occur in the brain. So Alzheimer's disease is actually an abnormal process that occurs in the brain, and it's caused by two abnormal proteins. Now, one protein forms outside of the brain cell, and we call that amyloid, and another protein forms inside of the brain cell, and we call that neurofibrillary tangle, and it's made up of a tau protein, so amyloid and tau. Now, these two proteins work together, and our brain cells die prematurely, leading to the symptoms that we see in people. Now, we can see these proteins under a microscope when looking at brain tissue, but that requires someone to die, and so it's not helpful when thinking about clinical trials. Now, in the doctor's office, we diagnose Alzheimer's disease based on what we see with the person, our patient. We look at the outside of this person to make this determination, and we use the history that's provided and the brain testing that we do in the clinic to first determine if someone has normal cognition or mild cognitive impairment or dementia. Now, the biggest difference between mild cognitive impairment and dementia is that someone with dementia has day-to-day -day functional impairments, such as a difficulty in managing medications or in driving or in handling their finances. And once we have that diagnosis, we use the details of the history, the pattern in the cognitive testing, the blood tests, and the brain imaging to help us determine if Alzheimer's disease is the primary cause. So there's no brain biopsy, and there's no looking for any of these abnormal proteins. Now, when I say that a person's clinical history helps us determine if Alzheimer's disease is the primary cause, what I'm referring to are the symptoms that a person has. So for instance, forgetting recent events or conversations, misplacing items, struggling to find a person's name. These are, are symptoms. But these symptoms vary from person to person because Alzheimer's disease can start in one place and then move in another. And this variation makes it difficult to predict a person's course of symptoms. Now in general, Alzheimer's starts in the memory center, what we call the hippocampus. But from there, how it spreads can vary. And so if it spreads to the front part of the brain, then a person's going to have problems with, with problem solving and planning. But if the first part of the spread is to the language center, well then a person's gonna report word finding or difficulty understanding words. And in less common cases, the, the spread can go to the vision center, and then a person's gonna report difficulty with judging distances or their depth perception. Now the disease even spreads to this behavioral control center which is why our loved one might feel agitated or even be socially inappropriate. So we see these symptoms, not because the person chooses to have them, but because the disease is affecting that portion of the brain. So in research, Alzheimer's disease is based on what we see on the inside. And when we start with the brain itself, we see that there's shrinkage, and that shrinkage represents brain cell death. And in general, it can be the, the whole brain but for some people, it's just that memory center, the hippocampus. So fortunately, we can identify these changes in living people through the use of MRI scans. 
But the problem with this is that brain shrinkage occurs later in the course of disease, and it's not unique to just Alzheimer's disease. So we need to go deeper and start looking at the cells that make up the brain tissue. And when we do this, we can identify those beta amyloid plaques and those neurofibrillary tangles. Now these changes are unique to Alzheimer's disease, and they're important in correctly identifying the disease. So the good news is that with advancements in technology, we don't have to wait for brain tissue in order to find them. We can see them in living people through the use of studying spinal fluid and PET scans. And what I'm showing you here are two PET scans, with the one on the left showing us the presence of amyloid protein, and the one on the right showing us the presence of that tau protein. And that red and the yellow that you see, that's the presence of that protein. So with our improved ability to identify this disease in living people, specifically those two abnormal proteins of amyloid and tau, the research community came together to create this new framework. Now this new framework is the evolving definition of Alzheimer's disease, and it represents a shift from clinical symptoms to a biological definition based on those proteins themselves. Now making this change is not easy, and it's controversial at times, but it's meant to improve our research by getting everyone on the same page, using the same language, and studying the right people who actually have Alzheimer's disease. So here's the framework that the scientists and the Alzheimer's Association put together in 2018. Pretty straightforward. Pretty easy to understand, right? No, it's not. These brilliant scientists took a complex disease and they made it more complicated. And then they put it in this very intricate table. So I'm really not gonna talk about it. <laughs> they took another stab at it, and they gave us this picture. Not much better, it's, it's not a ton better, but it's something we can work with. So I wanna spend a couple of minutes going over it. Let me see. So, do I have a pointer? Oh, All right. oh. okay, <laughs> thank you, Michelle. All right, so what matters most in this figure is the yellow circle, and the red circle. The yellow is amyloid, the red is tau. Now this green circle, well this represents cognitive impairment. And you see that it's all encompassing because Alzheimer's disease can cause it, but so can a lot of other diseases. And then we have the blue circle, that's brain cell death. So similar to the green one, lots of things can cause this, including Alzheimer's disease. So I want us to really ignore the green and the blue, and let's just focus on the yellow and the red. So this part that kind of looks like a moon, this is what we call having an Alzheimer's brain change. It just means that you have that amyloid protein. It is not Alzheimer's disease. It could be the beginning of the process, but it is not the same thing. In order to have Alzheimer's disease, you have to have amyloid and tau. So that's this overlap. So that's why they say Alzheimer's disease here. This is the key part of it. So this is an Alzheimer's change, but it's not the disease. This is Alzheimer's disease. Now this remaining red part, this means you have that tau protein that I was referring to, but it's not being caused by Alzheimer's disease. It's being caused by something else. A Little bit clearer? Okay. No? Well, really I just wanted to show that these brilliant scientists aren't brilliant at everything. So here's something that we created. So it's another one. What's that? A test, a test at the end of it, yes. Even I couldn't understand that first table, so I'm not gonna do that to you. But here's another way of looking at it, and now time is being considered. So we put this together. So we have amyloid forming in the brain, and while it's not Alzheimer's disease, it is the beginning of a process. And then tau tangles will form. And now amyloid and tau together mean that you have the research definition of Alzheimer's disease, regardless if you have symptoms. Now at some point, these two proteins are gonna to lead to brain cell death, which we can pick up on with an MRI scan. So these are the th same three things as the three circles in that last slide. And these are all research driven. However, when these changes that we see start causing symptoms, well now we've crossed this line and we're entering the clinical world. So a person with brain changes that has symptoms and performs poorly on brain testing, well, that's called mild cognitive impairment. And when those symptoms and the changes and the performance worsen, 
and a person also has day-to-day -day functional change, well, then that's what we call dementia. And so we call it dementia due to Alzheimer's disease because we believe the beginning process is due to that amyloid and tau. So you can start seeing how this research world is slowly making its way into the clinical world. So this evolving definition of Alzheimer's disease is important for researchers by having research, the research definition rooted in disease biology, the amyloid and the tau, the research community now has a framework from which to conduct the right studies and communicate them to each other and to you, the general public. Now, having this framework allows for researchers in clinical trials to enroll the right people at the right time of their disease in the right study. So in the past, studies were being done or enrolling people based on clinical symptoms, which isn't always accurate if telling if someone has Alzheimer's disease or vascular disease or Lewy body disease. So in the past, we may not have been studying actual Alzheimer's disease. It could have been something else. So if we are to understand Alzheimer's disease and the interventions that could help it, then maybe we need, well, then we need to make sure that these participants actually have the disease. So moreover, when researchers are comparing studies or they're building studies off of each other, we need to make sure that we're talking about the same disease. Are we talking about a duck or are we talking about a rabbit? And that matters when we're talking about working with other centers across the country. So having the research definition be based on actual proteins in the brain opens up the possibility for specific treatment targets. In essence, addressing the cause of the fire and not just the flames. But lastly, we can study Alzheimer's disease by seeing how do these proteins interact with other aspects of our health? And what does that mean for our overall cognitive performance? Humans are complex because we're not isolated in vacuums or in petri dishes. We have other medical conditions, medications, lifestyle behaviors. So understanding how the brain performs in the real world with amyloid or with amyloid and tau is important in figuring out how to treat real people. Now currently, our drug trials are looking to reduce the buildup of amyloid or clear it out more effectively. And I know Dr. Stana talked about that earlier. Now, these studies haven't been entirely successful, but that means it may take more than just amyloid treatment. And so studies are being designed to address the tau protein too. But the thing is, by having amyloid and tau as the basis for this disease, we now have other targets we can look at. So for instance, what is happening between the development of amyloid and the, the development of tau? What is going on there? And is there a target for us to treat that? But in the meantime, while the drug trials are being created and they're underway, we need to be looking at things we can do now to prevent or modify this disease, things that are in our control. Now, this is something that our center is very active in and, dare I say, leading the charge. Now, my colleague, Dr. Lindsay Clark, recently published a study looking at how other health factors contribute to memory loss in the context of having high amyloid levels in your brain. So she looked at obesity, defined as having a larger waist circumference, and high blood pressure, defined as having a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, to see what effect do these conditions have on brain performance, or, or really how did someone do on testing. Now, compared to people without any of these factors, high blood pressure did not worsen a person's cognitive performance. And the same was true for obesity. However, when you have obesity, and a high level of amyloid in your brain, that tipped the scales. So there was this synergistic effect of having amyloid and one of those factors, and it led to a faster decline in cognitive performance. So the same is true for blood pressure as it was for obesity, but it was not true for depression and high amyloid levels. So there is something here, and it's important since we can actually treat obesity and treat high blood pressure but we need to identify the right people to study and the right people to treat, which is why this evolving definition of Alzheimer's disease is so important and needed to further the research. So that was what was mentioned before. I have this podcast called Dementia Matters, which is launched by our own center. It's the only podcast of the 32 centers. And our aim is to provide education to the community about the latest in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver issues. Now, this topic of the evolving definition of Alzheimer's disease is covered in a few of the interviews that I've recently done. 
So I encourage you to listen to it, but also to stay tuned, because the science is moving fast, and our center wants you to be informed. Because hopefully that leads to making healthier decisions, but also we want to assure you that we are making progress thanks to you and your involvement in this work. Thank you.